So our goal during this unit is to look at exactly what are the characteristics and traits of an infection that enable a microbe to actually infect a host organism. So the idea <coughs> is that those organisms that cause disease are considered pathogen. And what's interesting is that the number of microbes in the human body actually outnumbers human cells. Now, we do have what are called normal flora. These are organisms that routinely reside on the human body. And as a matter of fact, they're supposed to be there. Most times, they actually help protect you. So we're going to look at a couple of different relationships that a microbe can have with a human being. So sometimes they actually act as anatomical barriers um, and then it forms almost like a mini ecosystem. So when we look at our skin and mucous membranes, um, they can demonstrate symbioses. And if you recall from biology, a, symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship is when two organisms live together on more or less a permanent basis. So there's mutualism where both partners benefit in the relationship. Now, one example is you actually have a strain of E. coli that lives in your intestine. Now the benefit to you is that it creates vitamin K, which your body can't create. Okay, E. coli gets a place to live, it gets free nutrients because you're eating, but then it produces vitamin K as a byproduct, which then helps us. Commensalism is when one partner benefits and the other is unaffected. Um, the example here is the Carinae bacterium um, that lives on the surface of your skin helps obtain nutrients. So basically it's getting nutrients off of your dead skin cells. Okay, and it's it doesn't hurt you, doesn't harm you, okay, but it's there. Now, oops, sorry, didn't mean to go forward. Now, parasitism is when one partner benefits at the expense of the other, okay? And this is most disease-causing organisms. So those that we consider pathogens um, are, are parasites, technically. Now, normal flora are acquired through birth and can be changed in response to the environment, such as changes in diet, acidity, or antibiotic intake. So you hear people talk about, well, after you've taken antibiotics that you're supposed to eat yogurt and put some of those intestinal bacteria back into your body um, to help create regularity, if you will. Um, and that's very true. So the normal flora inhibits potentially harmful organisms by, A, maybe preventing attachment, keeps those pathogens from getting on or in you, competing for essential nutrients. If there's direct competition for only one resource, one of them's going to win. Producing antimicrobial substances, secreting enzymes, can destroy other cells. Um, stimulating your immune response and inducing the production of antibodies so that your body is on a heightened sense of alert. Now, there are some basic principles of infectious disease. Um, and the first is the idea that in order for a microbe to infect a human or a host, there has to be this first step called colonization. And that implies that the microbes have become established on or in a host, okay? And that can lead to infection, right? So once colonization occurs, then infection can occur. And that's where the parasitic organism grows or multiplies on or in the body. So if you think about a population growth curve, you're going to see exponential growth, right? That's going to be infection. Now, disease occurs in the host only once there's noticeable impairment of function, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to see symptoms and you're going to see signs. But here's the thing. They could be very, very different. Symptoms are the effects of the disease that are only experienced by the patient. They're not visible. So things like, I feel sick, I'm nauseated, or, oh man, my leg really hurts, okay? Something that you feel pain for, nobody can, can quantify. Um, a sign, on the other hand, is an observable effect. 
Um, so maybe it's creating pus in a particular tissue or there's a rash or the person is vomiting. You can physically see them throwing up or there is swelling um, surrounding damaged tissue. Now, there's also um, the difference between what we call a primary infection and a secondary infection. And a primary infection occurs in a normal, healthy individual. Okay? That means that the pathogen that causes that infection, we would also consider a primary pathogen. A secondary infection occurs at the same time or immediately following a primary infection. It's almost opportunistic, if you will. So that's what we would consider a pathogen that causes a secondary infection is an opportunistic pathogen. So here I'm talking about the word pathogen, and we've studied that, that it's an, anything that causes disease, but pathogenicity would be the characteristic that we use to describe the ability of that microbe to cause disease. How strong is it? How dangerous is it to us? Okay, so the primary pathogen, like I said, can cause disease in a healthy individual, where an opportunistic pathogen can only cause disease in an unusual location in the body or in a person that's already immunocompromised. They already have a suppressed immune system, maybe because they're sick or there's something else going on. So virulence is going to be the attributes of the microbe that actually promote its pathogenicity. Okay, An avirulent microbe is not disease-causing. Avirulent, non-virulent. Okay? A highly virulent microbe has more disease-causing attributes. Maybe it releases toxins. Maybe it has a secret attachment weapon. Maybe it has a way to avoid your immune system. The more things that it has to avoid getting caught by your immune system, the more virulent it's going to be. Likewise, the more severe the symptoms and signs are going to be. Okay? Now, there are some other characteristics of infectious disease, and usually those that are studied um, in medical microbiology would be those that are communicable, those that are contagious. So those are going to be anything that is spread from an infected animal to another animal or human. Okay, Non-communicable means it cannot be transmitted from person to person. Now, one thing we like to look at is specifically the infectious dose number the number of microbes that actually have to be present in the host in order for the disease to occur. So remember I asked you to think about that population growth curve? Okay, picture that J-shaped exponential growth. If you already start higher up the y-axis with more cells, is the disease going to progress faster or slower? Hmm, hopefully you said faster. Let me give you an example here. Shigellosis you only have to come in contact with between 10 and 100 cells. That is a very small number, okay? But salmonellosis, you go out to a restaurant and for if you were even exposed to the salmonella bacteria, you'd have to ingest 10 million cells in order to actually develop the infection, okay? Now, think about that. 10 million cells versus 10 or 100. Which one are you actually more likely to get? Hmm. Follow me? Now, if you ever are reading in a text or in a journal article or in your research, you see the word ID50, that means that that is the number of microbes administered that resulted in disease in 50% of the population. So in testing subjects, they determined the number um, based upon the infection of 50% of the population. Kind of scary to think about, but they have done studies that way. All right, I think that right here is where we're going to stop for today.